All right, welcome to the Krypton Report. I'm your host, Tyler, and today we're going to talk about The Long Halloween Part 2. Now, if you're listening to this and you're like, well, why didn't you talk about The Long Halloween Part 1? Well, we did. It was a YouTube exclusive. So I had to bring back the boys to talk about that, and you know what? Maybe we'll throw up a Part 1 as, a, as an episode. We'll see how this month goes, because life is crazy. But it's horrible to hear me talk by myself, so I brought in the backup. Would you please give a round of applause for Mr. James Cole? What's up? All the way from like a, <laughs> <laughs> and all the way from a few miles down the road, welcome, Mr. Brian Peters. <sighs> Hello, ladies. Don't, don't forget about me. And that's Solomon, the boy of steel. And there's Sayla, the girl of steel, hanging out, moving around, being crazy with a few more days left till school starts. So let's jump right into this, guys. Um, jump in the line. Um, keep your body. Uh-huh. <laughs> so okay, many, I believe you. The Long Halloween Part 2. How many times, go around the room real quick. How many times did you watch it, James? I've only had a chance to watch it once because, you know, right I've got it on in the background right now. I watched the first one twice. I only watched the second once. And I'll I'll say I've watched the second one twice. And I will say that you should watch it twice. I feel that watching it the second time, I I liked it better. Um, Not that I didn't like it. I just felt like there was more. You get more out of it. Okay. Well, um, sometimes, sometimes when you know, because because you and I were such students of film and and comics and pop culture, I, I think when like, and I know this is what I do, and James gets on me all the time about it. When I watch it for the first time, I it, it, it's me studying it, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know. And then once I'm done studying it, and I'm like, okay, this is what we got. And then. Each time after it, I don't have to study it anymore. Like, I already know what's happening. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that's definitely why you enjoyed it more. And I, I need to sit down and just watch this one big movie. And see, that's my um, next point. Is right. I'm, I can't wait to buy this and watch this one movie. Because what I feel about this film is that I feel like when I started this movie... Yeah, I feel like I was watching a movie. I hit pause. I went and did some stuff for like a month. Then got then sat back down and hit unpause. I don't feel like it really started as a movie. The pacing is like we came in in the middle of a movie because we came at the beginning of like the mid movie montage. It was like the CW did it, you know? Like let's give you all this exciting stuff, and then we're just going to take a break for a couple weeks. Oh, oh, we're back. We're back. Now we're. Yeah. <laughs> you know that emotional roller coaster you were on? Um, yeah, screw that. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Um. So, also, I want to point out for anybody who has watched it or listened to us talk about it, jump over to Batman on Film and their podcast. They did an interview with the screenwriter both for part one and for part two. Um, so it, it was really helpful to hear him talk about it. Um, so yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll keep moving forward here. Um, you know, the thing about the film is, you know, it is a 12-issue book, 13-issue book, sorry. And we have three hours to do it, you know. But I feel like they, I don't know. What, Brian, why don't you go ahead. What, what was your overall just thoughts? Without spoilers, just kind of thoughts. Um... Without spoiling, um, I thought the I thought part one, just part two. Um, let's, I, I, we're trying I not know, to analyze. I know. I know. Part I know. one. Um, 
I felt like the pace was off. Um, I felt like so much stuff, especially in the beginning, uh, so much stuff got rushed. Um, I mean, I understand why they did why they did rush some things, um, but I felt like the pace was off in this one. I felt like the outcome was okay, but I didn't feel like it was written well enough to get that emotional punch that we could have really got uh, with the reveal and, and, and everything with holiday. Um, I, yeah, I, I felt this, I felt the second part just was, was a little bit of a mess. All right, James go. Um, <clears throat> the second part, it, it had a lot of story to tell. I think, uh, I think, Time jump gave it uh, opening, you know, kind of help with the how much story they had left to tell. Um, you know, it was some convenient timing at different places. And the one thing that I missed on this one that I enjoyed on the first one was every time someone was killed on a holiday mm-hmm. um, title card and. The and the scene from yeah. the scene from the comic book that showed yes. the murder weapon, the holiday item of choice, uh, left there. Now they were there, but they did not focus on them at all like they did in the first. So that's one thing mm. I did miss. And I agree um, with I enjoyed it. It it wasn't Go ahead. I, was gonna, I agree with both I'm, of you. I'm glad that James put that pointed that out. I'm glad that James pointed that out. Like it, 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 it did make it feel like you were watching a totally different movie it, at times. Like I'm with James on this. Like the focus was on something else in this one. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's why I feel like a lot of this movie, that's where I say like this movie starts in the middle of, if you were doing a regular film, this is where you have your montage, which is what this movie starts with. And then it has its shift. But just watching it by itself, it feels odd. Um, because it goes into like almost like a, it goes into like this film almost feels like a completely the whole thing's a third act or something. Because it goes into something and it's more of the Harvey Dent story. Now, when we're able to watch this seamlessly as one movie. It'd be very curious to see if I feel that or if it just feels like it just keeps going with the story and it makes more of that transition. But having that pause and then that reassemble, it definitely kind of takes, I think, away. Because the first film establishes, oh, this is holiday, this is holiday, you know. So when we get here, we're at that point where we as the audience should have already understood that. And now we're going to start showing a little bit more. Um but it's weird because we start this film. Like I said we start it, and it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it starts like a movie. You know, it's like you pick up where we left off. Um, so, yeah, which, which is, I mean, kind of what you could expect from from a two part um, right. film. You know what I mean? Like they, there are they could easily. And two part films, other two part movies have have done it better, um, where you where you pick up and it feels like an opening to a new movie, but um, just to but with the time constraints that they also have with these films, uh, they kind of just got to drop What's it back interesting, in. Interesting. Okay, just a little behind the scenes stuff that I learned. This film was written before Man of Tomorrow came out. And was done. So he wrote this, and then wrote Man of Tomorrow, and Man of Tomorrow got uh, produced first. When well, when was when was the JSA movie made? Like, or I'm sorry, when like in what order was the JSA movie written? Um, you, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's a different writer, so I don't know. So, okay. So I feel like I feel like. Considering what happens in, in you know, Long Halloween 2, um, I kind of feel like JSA or, or Long Halloween was ran a little bit with JSA in mind. 
because you got kind of got your origin story of the Flash in there a little bit, and then you have Man of Tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I was just wondering what the order was of writing stuff. Oh no, carry on. <laughs> well, I mean, at least, at least, um, I mean, the one thing I am uh, excited about is they they keep making these, these films, these standalone films. They they besides the animation style, they still look different because of the tone, and each one feels different because mm-hmm. of the characters and the tone. Um, like like Superman, uh, Man of Tomorrow, and justice society plus it was you know world war ii and and a, and another universe but i like how they're they're standalone completely but they are acknowledging that it is part of a greater yeah. developing uh cinematic universe animated cinematic i i i really like that like i i love it like i i think Sometimes, I mean, as as comic guys, <laughs> you know, we we start reading one story, and we're like, "Oh, well, now I now I gotta go pick up these these few comics so I get part of that story," you know. And even though it's 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 you know maybe Nightwing's story, oh, something else happened in Batman or something else happened in in, in Batgirl, and and you start to get that with movies now with comic book movies, especially Marvel, you know, like it's, you have to watch this to understand this. And I think DC needs to keep, I think DC needs to stick with this, like have a standalone stories. Like, of course we're going to have some justice league stuff in, in the future, but I think it needs to be standalone so that, people don't have to be like, oh, okay, I got to watch this, this, and this to understand this movie. Like, some people don't like other characters. Some people may mm-hmm. just want to watch Batman, might want to just watch Superman. So I, I think they need to stick with it. I think it's I think it's working great. I think it's do- doing yeah. very well. I mean, I, I like that there was the post credit scene that we're alluding to where Alfred answers the door and it's Flash, and it's the same Flash, that we met in Justice Society, and then it's the Green Arrow, which is cool because that shows that other characters are meeting off-screen that we don't know about. So, Brian, let's let's take it back to you real quick here. Um, what did you not like about the end? You talked about, now we're getting into spoiled territory, um, the reveal. You said it's a gut punch that we could have got. What what was off to you? Well, I mean, in the, in the first movie, um, you know, and I and I, I think I, I don't know if we talked about it in the first movie review or I said it in conversation to you guys separate, but um, you know, with uh, what the heck's her name? Gilda, Glinda, Gilda, Gilda. Gilda. Yeah. So, um, it was severely hinted at in that first movie that there was something with Alberto and Glinda. And or Gilda, Gilda, Glinda, Glinda the witch, whatever. Gilda. Uh, Mrs. Dent. So, so, <laughs> so, so, Gilda, Gilda. Oh my gosh! All right, Mrs. Dent. Um, you know, it was hinted at that something happened between them, and and the Roman took Gilda away from from Alberto, and. Uh, you know, Alberto, she wasn't to be part of that family. And you have this whole story of, you know, Gilda, Gilda lost her baby. Like the Roman took her baby away from it. The Roman took that baby out of her and, and made her get an abortion and destroyed mm-hmm. that whole life that she could have had with Alberto. And they could have been happy. And you have this this awesome story of where, you know, Gilda married Harvey. She wanted to get back at the Romans. She wanted to bring him down because he took her baby. He took her child. He took her life. And you get to this climax of two face with, with the Roman and, 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 and Harvey kills the Roman. You could have had the big reveal that Gilda was holiday all along 
which was never clear in the book. I mean, it was always hinted at, like you kind of thought maybe her and Harvey were doing, you know, things together. And that, and that probably happened in this movie, but um, you could have had this big emotional, powerful reveal of, of Gilda holding that gun to the Roman's head as, as holiday. And then Batman's there and, and two faces there and she blows, she shoots him. And because he took away everything that she won in life, like you see the story of her and Harvey, like they're not, they're not close. They're, they're barely in love. If at all, um, she wants a family and she'll never have that. And I feel, I feel like this opportunity for an amazing story for Gilda was just blown away, was just just tossed aside because you wanted to tell somewhat of a two faced story. But we know, but we know the two two faced story. We we know it. I mean, yeah. I mean, we you know, two faced deserves a great story. He does, but it was this story really supposed to be about two face, or is it supposed to be about the holiday killer and how Batman had to be a detective? And well, I mean, and you, the, it's, it's always led to the creation of Two Face, right? Right, and I I feel you got more of that in in Dark Victory. You get more of that story there, um, and and, and you get the story of Robin, um, but they took away that emotional punch, and then it leaves you hanging. Like, did she kill Alberto? And if she killed Alberto on that boat, like. Where's that port? Where's that? I want to see that scene where she, where she had to deal with killing the man she loved. Like, but she didn't love him anymore. That was the point. Was she was she was done. Like she was she was numb to it. Is what you're saying? She was gone. Gilda was gone, and that and that's the big thing. Is like she, at this point in the story, and she says like she did love Harvey, but emotionally she had checked out. Um, and she was upset because the, she married Harvey thinking that he would be the one to take down the right. room that to, that, and all this. And uh, first thing I want to say is I – and, you know, Tim Sheridan talked about this. He said they wanted to pick a lane and stay in it of who Holiday is. He says in the book it's written more ambiguous that, um, you know, it's Gilda, probably Dent. And Alberto, but Alberto, it's mainly Gilda, but Alberto kind of takes the heat because he wants the, he wants the power that comes with it. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. And for non-comic book fans and stuff like that, like you want a little bit cleaner, straighter story. And, you know, there's clues in it about Gilda and what I have liked, like what you were describing at the end, what I have liked that. Yeah. But the subtlety that Harvey covers for her because he realizes it was her. And then Batman discovers it, but yet in the same way, she gets away with it because they can't prove it. Harvey takes the fall for it. Jim doesn't know. And it's, you know, it stays closer to the book because would that have been too much of a departure from the book? Because even in this way, it's still a little bit of a departure, but it still stays pretty true to the book. Um, what do you think? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think that when you kill, um, excuse me, I think when you kill Alberto, you made you made the choice that you've changed the game. Yeah, this isn't going to be like mm-hmm. the book. So, so like, I mean, if you're, if you're going to make the choice to kill Alberto and like, and and you're going to make Gilda the clear cut holiday killer, why not give me that emotional mm-hmm. punch? Why not give me that emotional story? I think because why, you know, if you do, if you change too much, you get into trouble, you know, and changing just Alberto and making him dead and not bringing him back up and letting it just be cleanly in Gilda is a change, but not, not too much because she was also like one of the killers in the book. James, give us your opinion on the ending. 
Um, so, like, I, I, Gilda was, was one of the killers in the book. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the idea, the, like, revealing the story throughout, like, if they had revealed, um, uh, Albert, um, Alberto and, and Gilda's relationship and, of course, abortion, uh, of course, the forced marriage annulment, like, the, the mm-hmm. horrible stuff that they did. Um, they didn't even go into detail, but they, you know, we know from the first one that they mm-hmm. made her incapable of having children. So, like, they, they messed her up. And that was... So, it's... <clears throat> I... <sighs> I'm fine with the fact that they um, killed Alberto. Uh, I mean, it has. I agree. It has to be hard. That kill you know? had to be hard. Um, oh yeah, I, I totally agree that Harvey's the one that killed Alberto. I need. I want to go back and rewatch, watch it because Harvey killed Alberto, and um, of course he kills the Roman Gilda stuck at home because of the police. Well, the, um, the, uh, the, the reason he kills Alberto that night is like, because of the, because of what she had said, like before, mm-hmm. wishing, she, wishing he was somebody else. Nice catch. But nice they said down in the, yeah. in the town square yeah. when, when Joker attacked. So as a cohesive story, I think that that punch, you know, building up to, Gilda having that reveal and Harvey, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel much of a sense of loss with, with it not being Alberto. Honestly, I probably feel more sense of loss that, um, the Riddler got yeah. shot ar- around, you know, the Riddler wasn't Thank there you. present and Thank got you. shot around and didn't get killed during, um, during April Fool's. Then the fact that Gilda, is one of the killers. No, no, no I'm with so, you. That's our big loss. I'm, I'm, movie, I, I, I'm with you, James. The, the, the one thing. Go ahead, James. The only, the only thing, the only time I feel that Alberto was a killer was the first one on yeah. Halloween. Yeah. Um, because if Gilda did it, she'd be ruining mm. Harvey's work, Harvey's job. Um, going after the Roman and Alberto only has to gain from that by taking down somebody who's trying to rat out the family. And see, I think it's one way when you read like a mystery book and you can be a little bit ambiguous, I think in a comic because, and that's, I mean, it's kind of a one we talked about like Loeb writes really great stories but in the end. They get a little convoluted. And you're kind of left like talking to yourself, like who did what? And that's, I think, great sometimes for a book and sometimes for a film. But I think in this market with what they're doing, trying to make that into like an animation film and they end it with a sense of who really was Holiday, who killed who, may be more detrimental to the film, the story, than just like, like I said, like Tim Sheridan said, they picked a killer and they stuck with it. Um, so, yeah, and they they didn't leave they didn't leave it to to um to, to so ambiguous that it's like you know uh, as much as the book is like well then killed who if Alberto was involved and and Harvey and Gilda. Bill too. Basically, they they almost spell it out for you as who in this mm-hmm. as it all wraps up. The only one you could the only one you could think that had to have been different would be Beatty because of of who it protects. Yeah, just just wonder. yeah, killing killing Alberto, killing Alberto early. It 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 does help the story. Um, a little, a little bit. It do, it does help the story a little bit because it, it, you're not left guessing after he's killed who killed who. Uh, oh, exactly what you're saying. Um, 
I, I'm mm. not I'm not upset that it was Gilda. Um, I th- I think it needed to be Gilda really all along. I think Gilda killing being the killer is a better story. Um, yes. I, I, I am a little disappointed that we didn't get that emotional punch that we could have got. Um, See, I feel like we did. Like, you're building a completely different ending where Gilda would come out, reveal herself, because then that would be revealing herself to Batman, revealing herself to I, Jim I Gordon. See. But the idea that like Batman had to figure it out himself, and she got away with Harvey it. figured I, I, I it see, out. I see what you're saying. You know, and Harvey protected her by taking the well, fall. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the idea. Yeah, the idea of who figured it out is more because yeah. Harvey figured it out, Batman, and that's and and that's part of why he took the fall. When did when did the Roman figure out? Or decide who it was when he hired the assassin to kill her on the See, that's another thing. Do you on think the docks. The Roman knew it was her on the pier. Hmm. Well, the the assassin does say that he wasn't there to kill Harvey. He wanted to kill Harvey yet? I, you know, uh, you know, and and the 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 timing that I had that I said is kind of the convenient timing that I brought up is, is cat. She follows the assassin and she's just there in the nick of time, uh, on the pier. And then because she's following the Roman, no, she's okay. there in the so nick of time to help the ending. Let's talk Catwoman for a minute. I really like this Catwoman. I, I like this portrayal. They made her more modern. Um, they still gave her a little bit more anti heroishness and, playing both sides, but she was definitely leaning harder with Bruce. And I liked it. You know, it's kind of creating a good storyline for the future. Something a little bit newer that we haven't seen in these animated films. I Uh, hate this Catwoman. Really? She revealed, she she revealed who Bruce was. I don't give it, I don't give a crap. It's a mulligan. The guy's dead. I like, I like, (laughs) <laughs> I like that she takes her mask off and the Roman looks at her and calls her by her name. Her mother. I love name. that scene. That's a great scene. It's a great scene. Yeah, I love how they... So one thing that I really do like about what they've done here is they took the long Halloween and they took other stories that are tangentially connected when in Rome, yeah. to mm-hmm. like, like when in Rome. Um uh, Catwoman and ah oh, crap. There's another one that I can't remember now. But they, but anyways, they the idea that they've connected that story to this as well as um uh seeded the future relationship um because it's not it they're they're telling a story they're telling a story of of all this comic book history that we already know. So they're kind of like leaving things in to it that would, that weren't there necessarily. Like Selena's relationship at this time, there wasn't a relationship to be had. Um, it was just kind of a game cat and mouse. Um, you know, so just them being able to, to adapt so much history that we already have and, and put them as, as story build a fuller universe characters and relationships that mm-hmm. that took years to get By to starting it here we can already accept that there's a seed it history, you know? build, yeah I do like they hit on a lot of the points yeah. in the book uh, certain parts or beats were shuffled a little bit you know they're a little moved around um, but they were there you know, I think there's a little bit more Solomon Grundy in here than needed. <laughs> um, I I would have liked a little bit more Harvey becoming Two Face. Like I would like to seen like a scene of actual Harvey like losing his stuff, but it it was still really good and I enjoyed it. Um, Two Face is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Batman villain, and. So I really liked that this story had 
you know, more Two Face in it. Because I love the part where the two thugs have him, and he's on the phone. And he says he wants to talk to you, and he hands on the phone, and then he shoots the the guys. So I thought that was cool. I, I think I think that this this movie movies um did the original story uh good justice um i thought it was i thought it was done very well i thought the outcome was well um i guess my my only my only complaint is i as i wish we would have saw riddler and the april fools thing um cuz i thought that was a nice part in the book that like the holiday didn't kill on april fools so i thought that was kind of cool um but overall i'm overall i'm pretty satisfied with it um it, it didn't ruin the story like hush did <laughs> um you know because i we even talked about this like i i don't want the killer to be harvey and we were like oh what you know what if it's catwoman what if catwoman's a killer and we were a little worried about that um but it to, it told the story you needed to tell and it didn't ruin it like the hush movie did so Yeah, they tried to subvert expectations uh, a lot on Hush. Right. They no, learned their really lessons. Different. Yeah, they absolutely. This one, I think, I think they learned. Yeah, I think they learned their lesson about changing yeah. it I mean, to drastic. That's why I say, like, even um, like reading Hush, um, you go to the end and like the Riddler. Yeah, he was involved in kind of pulling the strings on stuff, but it was so convoluted and. Um, it just, it would have, they did really well with keeping it clean. Yeah. Um, I, I like, I love the uh, art style change uh, when Bruce was under the beer toxin. Um, I like how, uh, I like how, um, Alfred is mm. incredibly snarky with Harvey because oh, he's Alfred being an a hole at movie. the mansion. <laughs> yeah. Where he asks so, Gordon. Uh, which one was that? And Harvey, when is it? I'm paraphrasing now. Like, when is it no longer the son's responsibility to pay for the sins of the father? I I absolutely love oh, that line. Yeah. I love that line. So, yeah, Alfred. About, you know, they're talking down to Bruce. Yeah, about Alfred his nailed dad it. And what his dad did. And Alfred just, like, jumps in there, like, because it was because of Thomas Wayne. That's how the Roman was le- legitimized. What did you guys think about the coin's origin? Um. So, I'm. I see. I see Bruce got it from. From. Roman, and then yep, wasn't that? Yep. Didn't he give it to sure. Harvey in the first one? Okay, see, I, I'm, I'm, I was vague, vaguely remembering on it. So, I mean, the fact that Harvey can't make a decision without something that came from the guy he's been trying to bring down that he's hated for so long. Mm-hmm. You know, talk. That's and, that's you know, iron. I just, I love that about. Harvey, like I think, man, I just, I would love to see a movie that really gets more into Two Face, um, you know, like in live action or something, where we get a a movie, a full movie of good Harvey Dent, you know, and then in the second one you start to see the anger, yeah. you start to see like him having problems, maybe even he has some sort of trauma, where. He starts having issues, like you said, making decisions and like, you know, trying to choose a side and really starts having problems. And then the big trauma of the face happens and that's where he really snaps. See, see that's what I thought we were going to get with the Dark Knight. Like when Aaron yeah. Eckhart was cast as, as Harvey Dent in the Dark Knight, I, I thought we were going to get a whole movie with, with Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent. And then Two-Face would be the villain in the third movie. That's what I thought we were gonna do, and then when you had that whole scene with him in the, in the gasoline, I was like, "Oh, okay, they're pulling this trigger pretty early." Okay, <laughs> but I'm mm-hmm. with you. I yeah, like yeah, 
Well, his, you know, I mean, Absolutely. his performance was fantastic, and, and he was a great two face for the. He was a great two face for the movie, but um, he was still not. But for the movie, he wouldn't work anywhere else. He's not. He's not uh, a definitive two face. Um, you know, I mean, for him, he's still just Harvey Dent. It's just he believes in in fair chance now. You know, it's the flip of the coin, you know, live or die. So it was not, it definitely is not the same, same Harvey Dent that we get here. Um, it has some you know, schizophrenia going on, uh, split personality disorder, um, starting to feel itself stress of the job and his marriage and, um, and these murders, obviously, whatever murders he committed and whatever murder she committed, I mean, it had compounded his, <laughs> compounded his stress to why, to why he was cracking. I think they did a really good job here though. He had a, he, it was a very, very challenging story for Hart to go from being this district attorney who wants to take down a nice crime to, being two faced, like he fell, he cracked, he, he and he has he has yeah. two sides to his personality. My uh, so I, I think it's a, a very um, well, just like very well Brian done. Said really about companions. I just read Two Face, uh, Year One, the two part book on DC Universe Infinite or Infinite whatever Universe, whatever it's called anymore. Um. <laughs> And that Universe was like a good Infinite, story yeah. that kind of went with it. You know, you <laughs> see a little bit more of, like, the stuff that happened, like, slightly off to the side during the events of the long Halloween. And um, the other thing is, if, you know, we all know that the Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie did a lot better than anyone ever thought it would. And if they were to do that with another character, I think Two-Face is the character I want to see. Like, if they did another villain origin movie like that, I think Two-Face fits perfect in that mold. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Just like what we've talked about, like, you get really get into Harvey, get into his psyche, get into, you know, his failing marriage. And, like, you could even do kind of a story similar to this, but all from Harvey's point of view, like you really don't go on the ride with like a Batman or a Jim Gordon or whatever. It's just Harvey. I'll make it. I'll get on that. <laughs> now my question to you is, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. How do you feel about Joaquin Phoenix going to be Pattinson's Joker? <laughs> yeah. So, so real quick, no, no, that's. Like, I was, we'll, we'll, we'll close you know it's gonna this. happen. But. Brian and I had this conversation. I even asked Jania about it too. Okay, I asked her the same questions that Brian and I were talking about because we said I don't want to see another live action Joker. And you know, I said you could give me more Leto because he's already been established. And then Brian said, you know, well. What if they rolled up Joaquin Phoenix Joker to be, you know, Pattinson's Joker? No, it's like, not. It's not I'm a what okay if. It's that. going to happen. It's not a what if. I'm like, it's, it's I'm okay happen. with that. I just don't want to see another new live action Joker for at least 15 years. You know, I mean, think about it. Within a short period of time, we had three different versions on Gotham: Leto, Joaquin. Okay, so even if you start, we'll say in 10 years from from Heath Ledger's in 08 and we jumped to 2018. Okay. Joaquin came out what 19. So in 11 years, we'll, we'll, we went, we had Heath Ledger's three on Gotham, Joaquin and Leto. <laughs> and think how long we went from Jack Nicholson's before we even got to Ledger's. So it's just one of those things. Twenty years. 
I don't, I just, I don't want I was like, 19 this years cake or whatever. And, you know, they just don't get a chance to really do it justice. Cause I mean, I'm not even hundred percent like Joaquin's version is not completely right to me. Leto never really got to do his version of the Joker. That's on the editing, the cutting room floor. So I don't want these half done versions, but at the same time, like I don't want to see another Batman movie where, you know, the villain is the Joker again and again th- and again. I think that there's other characters and that the new Pattinson version can, you know, dig. So thoughts real quick, James. We'll wrap this up. Well, it depends on that. Right. Depends on what they're doing, you know. I'll just take. They're just taking Nolan's uh, Nolan's universe into an even grittier. A uh, realistic take on see how they blend realism comic does. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I I mm-hmm. I enjoyed Long Halloween Part. I I actually can't wait to watch the whole thing, um, Part One and Part Two, and and see how the the story uh, the story unfolds. Um, as as a cohesive movie. uh because like when when you watch uh the dark knight returns you know it's mm-hmm. it's almost a separate movie yeah when it comes to part 2 um you know it's it's yeah. just really a sequel you know what i mean like this is the same story that goes on um and death and the death and return of Superman. Movie. You know what I'm saying? In a lot of ways, it's a part um, two, but it is a completely I, separate movie. Also. It, it, it absolutely is because it tells a whole different chapter, but you know, does it, it does flow a little more, I think from one movie to the next. I don't know. I just, I just, it, it feels like this is, mm-hmm. This is the same story. It's not. It's not a movie that had what seemed to be an ending, and the story's not over. Yet. And you know, the like, sequel the, is, like the other. You know, the sequel of the book is Dark Victory, and even the writer said when they were writing the Long Halloween that they were instructed, "Don't think of Dark Victory. Write the Long Halloween." So, I'm sure there's a way to write around it. I need to reread Dark Victory in detail to, and think like that. But I feel like in a lot of ways this movie set up the themes to carry into Dark Victory about Batman working alone. You know, and Catwoman saying like he could use a partner or whatever. Um, so I would say I, I, w- I would that. say you need you need to give me you need, you need to give me two more Batman animated films before you do Dark Victory. Because I want to see this Batman alone before you bring in Robin. Like, we, we need a little bit, just a little bit of this Batman. But, in saying that, I really, I really want to see the Bat Family. But I want to see the Bat Family more live action. Together? together. Like, we have every member of the Bat Family in live action somewhere. In some Never version. together. But I want to see them together. Absolutely. Um, I I feel with this I feel with this universe that they're making they're kind of getting like they're it seems like they're getting kind of on the ground floor with most of the characters so far at least um, so we get Superman at the beginning we get Batman at the beginning it's, it's like you're two learning that he's going to have to be uh, a better tech than you thought he would ever have to be and yeah. It, to to continue his to continue his story as it were to evolve with the Bat family, like wouldn't be able to waste much time by having you know more than two solo films before the mm-hmm. before the family starts. I honestly think that from this one they would start going with Robin the next, one, you know, and then. Maybe even a time jump, and then they get the second Rob. That makes sense. Death of the family. All right. Well, we're going to put a pen in it there, and, you know, maybe we'll revisit the subject for sure 
when um, when hopefully they'll release you know the the collected as one film soon instead of waiting so long we can revisit it and plus we have that special in October long Halloween book James Brian thanks for the chat you can find their info in the in the notes below hook them up on Twitter uh, you know leave your comments let us know what you're thinking and remember look up in the sky. Hello, everybody. I just want to let you know that Southgate Media Group has its own Patreon. That's right. For $5 a month, you can get exclusive shows, content, and interviews with the different podcasters of the network. This Week in Geek is a Patreon-exclusive only series. So check it out. Go www.patreon.com slash Southgate Media Group. We are always adding new content. If you want to help out this show and any other show on Southgate Media Group and you really don't have the extra money to do so, check this out. Go to southgatemediagroup.com. At the top, there's a link to Amazon. Click that, log into your Amazon, shop and buy like normal, and part of the money that you spend comes back to us to help us with our podcasts. The Krypton Report is part of the Southgate Media Group network of podcasts. If you have an interest, check out Southgate Media Group to see if your podcast is there. I bet it is. At the Southgate Media Group website, you can sign up for our newsletter. You'll get info on all the shows and you can find what you want. You'll also find links to our sponsors where you can get great products and support the podcast. Also, our book, Pod Life, Podcasting Stories. It's a great book. Check it out. It's nice to hear where people come from and why they do what they do. If you're like me and you love listening to different podcasts about Superman, I have a few that I want you to check out. Some of my favorites are The Last Sons of Krypton. Connor and Ray are always reviewing different books, and it's really nice and refreshing to kind of dig back into older stuff. The aspiring Kryptonian, Tasman and her team are always finding interesting people to interview. Digging for Kryptonite has become one of my favorite ones to listen to, as Anthony digs into different eras of the character. There's always the Always Hold On to Smallville, which I've guested on before, if you're wanting to step back into that nostalgia realm. So check out all these, and there are many, many more. So check out our Twitter, because we're constantly finding new podcasts that inspire and bring hope to everyone.